بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد رسول الله I begin with the name of Allah All praise belongs to Allah And may peace and blessings be upon the Prophet Muhammad For he is the messenger of Allah Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Alhamdulillah So so far we've been talking about At-Tahara Purification And one aspect of At-Tahara Is removing physical impurities What's called Najas in Arabic now, all these things that we covered, all these impurities, they're pretty obvious. They're pretty self-evident for people living in the modern world. If your child walks into the house and he has dirt on his hands, you say, okay, that's dirt. Let's just wash it. If he has blood on his hands, most parents would freak out because this is a sign that something is wrong. So this is obviously an impurity when we see it. Likewise, vomit. Urine and feces. There's so many diseases that are spread through urine and feces. Because we have plumbing, we have safe water and clean water, we don't realize this. But there's many people in the world who they don't have these luxuries. May Allah Ta'ala protect us all. Liquid intoxicants and carrion, pretty straightforward. If you see an animal carcass on the side of the road, you're probably not supposed to be touching this. This is probably full of disease. And dogs and pigs. Dogs and pigs is pretty interesting because if you talk to people nowadays, they might think dogs are not so bad. They're not so impure. I see dogs all the time. Again, we're living in a modern day context. Most of the dogs that we see, they're well groomed. They're well taken care of. They're on a leash. Sometimes they eat better food than some human beings, unfortunately. So that's the world we live in. I still remember growing up in New York City in the 80s and 90s. Every so often, we would be outside, me and my friends and just random people on the street. And all of a sudden, you would see a stray dog. How do you know it's a stray dog? because it looks mangy, it looks tired, it's just walking the street for no reason. And I have vivid memories. When everyone saw this mangy dog, everybody would run away. <laughs> because if you see a stray dog, it might bite you because it's probably hungry, or it might have rabies. And if you get bitten by a dog with rabies and you're not taken care of, you can die within a matter of days, literally. So most of the dogs that we see nowadays, we look at them, they look pretty clean. That's not the case for most of history. And I'm sure there's many parts of the world today that there's stray dogs and people to this day are still scared of them because they don't know what kind of diseases these dogs can carry. That's the thinking here. This is an impurity, not because the dog is well-groomed and it looks nice and it's taken care of. If you come across a dog that's not being taken care of, you don't know what it's carrying. Now, we're going to hone in on one other particular impurity, and that is urine and feces. Urine and feces. And we're going to get into the topic of istinja. How to clean yourself after relieving yourself in the bathroom. Now, when we talk about cleaning yourself after using the bathroom, some people, when they hear this, they sort of roll their eyes because they may be thinking to themselves, I learned this when I was a child. When I was two years old, three years old, I was potty trained. And now why do I have to learn this after all these years? It's important when you study fiqh in general that we're not just studying rules in isolation. All of this is part of revelation. The prophets were sent to teach us how to be human beings, the most dignified versions of ourselves. And one thing that we do, no denying it, is use the bathroom. So it would make sense that part of this guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to keep ourselves clean, presentable, and free of all impurities. And so you should keep this in mind when we study the subject of istinja. Another aspect of this is that no matter how much money you have, no matter how big your house is, no matter how influential you are in the world, every so often when nature calls, you have to answer that call. You have to answer that call and use the bathroom. And nothing is more humbling than this. Imagine a mighty king sitting on a throne. Even this king, every so often, he has to step down from his throne and he has to scurry to the bathroom, from one throne to another throne. Why? If he doesn't do this, he will end up soiling himself. So even the biggest, baddest person in the world, he's not so big, he's not so bad after a while because he has to use the bathroom. He has to scurry into the bathroom, squat down, protect himself from other people looking at him and use the bathroom as if he was a barnyard animal. So keep this in mind. Don't be intimidated by anybody. Anybody you meet at the end of the day is a human being like me and you. Alhamdulillah. With that said, don't view this topic as something that's beneath you. Why am I learning this? Why am I learning how to use the bathroom? I know how to do that already. 
If you're a child, put aside all your giggles and laughter. This is a serious topic. Enter this subject with a mature mind, and inshallah ta'ala, you'll get benefit from that. Likewise, if you're a grown-up, remember that the companions, they were all grown-ups. Many of them were married, many of them had children, some of them had grandchildren. And when they met the Prophet wasallam, they were humble enough to learn this subject as if they were children all over again. One of the disbelievers in Mecca, he actually made fun of Salman al-Farsi. Salman al-Farsi is one of the great companions. May Allah Ta'ala have mercy on him and be pleased with him. And this man went up to Salman al-Farsi and he said, I see that your buddy, your companion, he teaches you even how to defecate. He's making fun of him. Your prophet teaches you everything, even how to use the bathroom. And what did Salman al-Farsi say? He said, Ajal. Ajal in Arabic means yes indeed. It's an emphatic reply. You're right. He even taught us how to use the bathroom. He could have said Naam, which means yes, but he said Ajal. Because the truth is, there's no shame in studying this topic. The only shame is if a person is too arrogant to study this topic. He thinks this topic is beneath him. If a person lives like this, he's going to miss out a lifetime of rewards. Because how often do we use the bathroom? All the time. All the time. And we know that if we do certain actions in our life that seem mundane, that seem not important, if we're mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we emulate the Prophet while doing these actions, we will get rewards for these actions. There's no little action in our life. Every single action in our life has importance if we're mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while we do them. Now, traditionally Muslims, both men and women alike, they would relieve themselves by squatting down, by sitting down. And most people throughout history did this. This is a very natural thing to do. Firstly, because when you sit down, when you squat down, this is the most comfortable way to expel waste. You don't have to strain any muscles. You just squat down and it just comes out naturally. Secondly, when you squat down, when you sit down, what happens is you prevent urine and feces from soiling your clothing. And so throughout human history, people just naturally sat down. They squatted down to use the bathroom, whether urinating, whether defecating. With that said, it's not prohibited to stand up when you urinate. But you just have to keep in mind, make sure that no urine falls on your clothes. Because if it does, you can't pray while wearing these clothes. And that's why, by default, most Muslims, they usually sit down when they're using the bathroom, regardless if they're urinating or if they're defecating. Now, there's one aspect that we have to talk about. It's not mentioned very often, but it's very important. That is, after you relieve yourself, after you use the bathroom, primarily urinating, men in particular, they have to do something called istibra. Istibra literally means expulsion. Emptying your bladder of urine. That's what this means. So, after you urinate, you have to make sure that all of the urine has been expelled from within you. Why? Because if you don't do this and you stand up, later on, some urine may exit involuntarily. So, as a man, when you urinate, this is what you do. You do something that ensures that all of the urine has been released from within you. Now, there's various things you can do. You can, for example, tighten your bladder muscles. You tighten your bladder muscles so that any urine that's remaining comes out. Or between the belly button and the genitals, there's a little pouch that every single person has. If you press lightly on that pouch with your finger, that will help expel anything that's in there, whether urine or feces. Or some people find that coughing, coughing loudly so that your body shakes, that expels the remainder of the urine. Whatever you find works for you. That's what you do to ensure that all of the urine has been expelled. That's for men. For women, they don't have to do any of this. For women, all they do is when they urinate, they simply wait for a moment and then that's done. That's it. So this is how you relieve yourself. Now, after you do this, you have to clean yourself. This is called istinja, cleaning yourself after relieving yourself in the bathroom. So this is how we clean ourselves in the bathroom according to the Sharia, the sacred law. Again, as a reminder, this is not just some mundane action. If you do this while being mindful of the fact that you're following in the footsteps of the Prophet wasallam, this is actually an act of worship, something to keep in mind.
So there's three methods of cleaning yourself in the bathroom after you urinate or defecate. First, you use toilet paper followed by water. You use toilet paper in order to remove the bulk of the filth, usually in the case of defecating. So you use toilet paper to remove the feces from your backside. And once that feces is removed, then you pour water over that area so that all the traces of filth is gone. This is the best method because it's the most thorough method. You're taking out the bulk of the filth and then you're removing the traces of the filth with water. So that's the first method. You use toilet paper to remove the bulk of the filth. You use water to remove the traces of the filth. The second method is using water alone. No toilet paper, nothing else. So you use the water to remove both the bulk and the traces of filth. And this is typically done after urinating because when you urinate, there's really no filth to remove. So you just put water over the private areas to wash away the filth. Now, after you do this, some people prefer to use toilet paper to dab the private parts so that it's dried off. You can do this. It's not necessary. It's not obligatory. But if you want to make sure that you're dry, you can do this after putting the water. That's perfectly fine. So that's the second method. Again, the first method is the most preferred one. Second method, less preferred, but still it's fine to do. Now, here's the third method. The third method is you use toilet paper only. You don't use water, just toilet paper on its own. So you take the toilet paper and you remove the bulk of the filth and the traces of the filth as well. This method has its own name. It's called istijmar. Istijmar means cleaning with stones. Why stones? Because traditionally, that's what people used. Toilet paper is a relatively new invention. In the past, people used stones to do the same thing that toilet paper is used for today. So istijmar. And this is the least preferred method of the three, because you'll notice if you've ever done this, when you wipe and you wipe and you wipe, no matter how many times you wipe, it still feels like there's a trace of filth there, particularly feces. It still feels like you're not really completely clean. And that's the case. You're not really completely clean. But if you don't have any water around, what are you going to do? This is the least preferred method. But if this happens, it's fine to do. Now, something to keep in mind. When you use this toilet paper or stones, as traditionally was used, you have to use at least three of them. So in terms of toilet paper, this is what you do. You take toilet paper, you clump it up, you wipe once. You then get another clump of toilet paper, wipe again. You then get another clump of toilet paper and wipe again. At least three times. After those three wipings, if you find that there's still feces, then you keep wiping until there's no more traces of feces. If you're using a clump of toilet paper that is large and thick enough, this is what you can do. You can wipe once, fold it, and then wipe with the same toilet paper on another side of it. As long as that filth that you folded within the toilet paper doesn't touch you again. So if you have a big clump of toilet paper, and many people do, you wipe once, you fold the filth, the feces within it so that you can no longer see it, you wipe with another side of that same toilet paper. This would be considered two wipings, and then maybe at that point you would need another sheet of toilet paper to finish the third wiping. And again, if three times is not enough, then you keep wiping until all the bulk and traces of that filth is removed. So that's that. Let's see how Imam Nawawi explains all of this. He says, Cleaning oneself of an impurity after relieving oneself is obligatory. It is recommended to do so with a stone followed by water. Here he says a stone, hijara, because again, traditionally, people use stones back in the day. Now we use toilet paper. Same thing. Same idea. It's recommended to do so with a stone followed by water, but water alone suffices, or three stones which remove the impurity from the place of excretion, provided they fulfill the conditions listed below. Now this section is pretty interesting. Imam Manawawi basically says, okay, stones is what we use historically, but you can use a substitute for stones. And so he describes what the substitute can be. Anything suffices as stones as long as it is solid, pure, removes the filth, not something deserving respect, and not edible. These are the five stipulations for the validity of cleaning oneself with stones or the like without having to follow by washing with water. So let's talk through this. Solid. Solid means that you can't use a liquid other than water. If you're cleaning yourself in the bathroom, it has to be either water or a solid object. 
you can't use any other liquid to do this. That object itself has to be pure. So for example, you can't use animal dung to clean yourself in the bathroom. Common sense to me and you, but there's a time when people used to do this. So the object that you're using as a replacement for stones itself has to be pure. It also has to remove the filth. So for example, you can't use sand. Sand doesn't remove filth. It just clings to your body. So that wouldn't do the job. And it can't be something that deserves respect. For example, a book of knowledge. You can't take pages from a book of knowledge and wipe yourself in the bathroom because that book of knowledge deserves some respect. And it can be edible. So you can't use any kind of food items to clean yourself. And with all of that said, toilet paper fulfills all of these conditions. So you can use toilet paper nowadays as a replacement for stones, likewise tissue, likewise tissue paper, anything along those lines. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ala sahabihi wa ala atbaihi hatta yamqiyamati wa salam tasliman kathira.